I'm Ron Strickland. This webcast is one of a series in which I'm presenting some brief lectures and commentaries on topics from the courses I teach in literature and cultural studies. This particular installment is the third in a series on Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. In earlier webcasts, I've said some things about Geoffrey Chaucer's biography and about the socio-historical conditions of England during the time that the Canterbury Tales was written. Here we'll begin to consider the text of the poem. The setting is a pilgrimage. A group of travelers are gathered together at the tavern, an inn on the outskirts of London, in preparation for a pilgrimage to Canterbury Cathedral, to the shrine of St. Thomas Becket. It's a disparate group of travelers, unknown to each other, but they're thrown together for the journey, and they will agree to travel together and to tell stories along the way for their mutual amusement and diversion. Chaucer begins by describing springtime in England. The cold winter is over, flowers are blooming, birds are singing, and people feel the urge to go on pilgrimage. We have a text of Chaucer's original Middle English with an interlinear translation in Modern English. I'll read a few lines in Middle English so that you can get a sense of what the rhythm might sound like. When the April with his sure thought, the drop to march hath perished to the root, and bothered every vine in switch liqueur, of which virtue engendered is the fleur, when Zephyrusek with his sweet breath, in spirit hath in every holt and hearth the tender acropis, and the younger son hath in the ram his half coursey run, his small foolish mocking melody. That slept in all the nick with open ye, so prick at him not here in your courage, than longing folk to go on pilgrimages. So to paraphrase this in modern English would be something like March winds bring April showers, the April showers bring May flowers, the birds begin to sing, the bees will show up to gather nectar from the flowers. Spring is in the air. That's when people get the urge to go on a pilgrimage, a spiritual pilgrimage. But it may be more than simply spiritual. It's a nice time to go on vacation. There's an undertone of sensuality and sexuality. The way that Chaucer describes the flowering of the plants and the singing of the birds here is similar to the way that we might use the phrase the birds and the bees to refer to young romance and sexuality. Birds like sparrows in Chaucer's time were considered to be sexually hyperactive. So Chaucer refers to the birds sleeping all night with open eye. Are they really sleeping? So, at any rate, van long and folk to go on pilgrimages. And he continues, And palmares for to sick strong strands, The fern how was cool and sundry lounges. And specially from every shearer's end of England to Canterbury they wend. The holy blissful martyr for to sick, that him hath open when that they were sick. So folk longed to go on pilgrimages to distant shrines known in various lands, and especially from every shire's end of England to Canterbury they travel, to seek the holy blessed martyr who helped them when they were sick. Chaucer now tells us he will describe the specific situation and the characters with whom he will be traveling on his pilgrimage to Canterbury. It happened that in that season on one day, in Suffolk at the Tabard Inn as I lay, ready to go on my pilgrimage to Canterbury, with a very devout spirit, at night had come into that hostelry well nine and twenty in a company of various sorts of people, by chance fallen in fellowship, and they were all pilgrims who intended to ride toward Canterbury. The bedrooms and the stables were spacious, and we were well accommodated in the best way, and, in brief, when the sun was gone to rest, I had so spoken with every one of them that I was of their fellowship straight away, and made agreement to rise early, to take our way where I will tell you. But, none the less, while I have time and opportunity, before I proceed further in this tale, it seems to me, in accord with reason, to tell you all the circumstances of each of them, as it seemed to me, and who they were, and of what social rank, and also what clothing that they were in. And at a night, then, will I first begin. So Chaucer is going to describe each of the characters. And in his descriptions, we will hear him 
representing the characters as they represent themselves, mostly. Chaucer's narrator is an easy-going, credulous sort of fellow, and people don't always represent themselves to strangers in a way that is absolutely faithful to their true characters. So much of the humor of the satire will come from moments in which we can read between the lines of Chaucer's descriptions to see ways in which these characters have flaws that they are not admitting. As Chaucer says, he'll begin the descriptions with an account of a knight who is traveling with the company. And that's where we'll pick it up in the next webcast. With that, I'll conclude this webcast. But, as always, if you have questions or comments, send me an email.